Good morning, everybody. Um, so in the interest of time, I won't belabor my many thank yous. Um, but thank you to Teresita um, and to Olga Garay English and to the Ford Foundation. And I especially want to thank Miriam Jimenez Roman for her presentation, which lays the groundwork to get us started today. Um, and I want to acknowledge that in a few minutes, I'll quote from the work of her esteemed late husband, Juan Flores. So I want to mark what a profound impact Dr. Flores had on the field of Latino studies. So I've been asked to address two broad questions. Why are US Latinx still underrepresented in the scholarship and the academic discipline of art history? I am an art historian. I'm on the faculty at Tufts University. So that's really the perspective that I'm talking about today. Um, but of course, it intersects and it's entangled with everything that we'll talk about today. And then how do barriers in the academic pipeline affect the bigger picture? So I want to begin by establishing and then also complicating what it is we're talking about here. What is Latinx art? Like the very term Latino, Latina, Latinx, which not all within that imagined community embrace, um, the category and the concept of US Latinx art is intended to be a term of pan-ethnic unity. And I want to say that you'll hear me say US Latinx repeatedly, because in my experience at Tufts, people always think I'm talking about Latin American studies. OK. And that, that's a problem, a huge problem. OK. So many of us working in the arts have embraced the term insofar as it cuts across and also gathers our differences, cultural, socioeconomic, racial, and even linguistic. These differences aside, many of us have embraced this imagined inclusive community because without denying the salience of our particularities, we're stronger, the greater, and the more cross-cutting our numbers. So I'd like to suggest that as we do our work today, we reflect on the term critically and the concept and also use it with the awareness that it can be expressive of self-determination and self-representation in the face of misrepresentation and continual defamation, but it can also be a term of, of encompassment, one that obscures these very different histories. So we may be immigrants or diasporic, our homelands may be colonized, and in addition to crossing borders, of course, borders crossed us. The concept that's brought us together here today may feel foreign or ill-fitting for some, I actively employ the term because for me it fits. I'm a Mexicana raised in Ohio, teaching on the East Coast. So I'm not quite a Chicana. I'm not really a Mexicana anymore. I think you get the picture. So I want to situate Latinx art also in relation to the field of Latinx studies, which is an academic discipline and a field of inquiry that studies the history, the culture, the politics, and the experience of people of Hispanic ancestry in the US. And scholars in the field draw from numerous disciplines, including cultural anthropology, gender studies, history, film, visual and literary studies, political science, and so forth. So as the eminent scholar, thinker, and activist, Dr. Juan Flores once wrote, quote, Latino studies has its historical raison d'etre in the unresolved historical struggles over immigration, racism, and colonialism, close quote. In his book, From Bomba to Hip Hop, there's a wonderful chapter where he summarizes um, and assesses the origins and shifts in the field, and it's still extremely timely. He notes, of course, that in the academy, one of the original roots of Latino studies were the Chicano studies programs at U of California schools, particularly at San Francisco State, also in Texas, and a few East Coast schools. Um, for example, the Centro de Estudios Puerto Riqueños at CUNY, founded in 1973. But he notes that the widespread growth of Latino studies with that term in the academy really occurred in the 1990s, at which time students at several East Coast schools, including the Ivies, and this is about um, how, how visibility comes to. So it's as if the Ivy sanctioned that this was a field. Um, but they staged protests too and sit-ins demanding the creation of Latino studies programs. And concurrently, there was an attrition and a shrinkage of ethnic studies fields at state schools. So that's very telling. For students and faculty, involved in the movement to establish Latino studies, the term expressed unity and inclusion, but also, crucially, as Dr. Flores observed, the concept, and indeed the term itself, relates to the diversification. And this isn't just literal diversification, but it's also a diversification of consciousness, I think. So diversification, including the increasing transnationalism and internal geographic dispersal of Latinos. So I wanted to trace this context quickly because the roots and origins of Latino studies exemplify the very politics that so many in the field of art history remain resistant to. So I find the concept of epistemic occidentalism to be a useful formulation for thinking through problems in my field. For example, many of you will recall the Washington Post columnist Philip Kentecott's unfavorable review of the Smithsonian's exhibition, Our America, the Latino Presence in American Art. 
There, Kentakot attributed the so-called failure of that major art exhibition as its focus on an ethnic minority group. Well, for Kentakot, for Kentakot, much of the art on view was provocative and interesting, the organizing logic of the exhibition around the Latino presence in American art, and the exhibition's aim to be inclusive and com comprehensive were flawed because he concluded Latino art is a meaningless category. In one statement, he just sort of eviscerates us. So Kentakot evidently missed entirely the curatorial assertion, and of course Carmen Ramos is here, that Latino art is American art, and of course it is. Thankfully, Kentakot's many blunders incited a rich and substantive discussion. I, I find opportunity in these kind of blunders. It's, it's comedic, but, um, and I want to highlight artist Alex Rivera's intervention, um, which originated as an online post to Kentakot's review. Um, and then Kentakot invited Rivera to have a uh, public conversation, and Rivera made several key points. While critics raise doubts about categories like Latino art, there's rarely any discussion about the absence of work in show after show that keeps groups like Latinos on the margins. That's a quote. <clears throat> Furthermore, Rivera also pointed out that generalized categories like American art are so naturalized that they mostly remain unquestioned. And he also affirmed that, uh, that while Latino is a demographic category, it's also a category of identity that is useful for myriad political reasons. And I'll add useful for, for throwing into relief the many entangled histories that follow in the wake of colonialism, imperialism, political intervention, and social inequality. Among other key points Rivera raised was that he questioned Kentakot's invoking the concept of artistic quality as a universal. Um, because after all, quality or aesthetic value is a concept entirely determined, as Amelia Jones has written, by masculinist European colonialist values. So to summarize, Rivera and Kentakot's conversation was another inst instance of a person of color educating a white person about the myth of colorblindness, about racist hierarchies and exclusion, and about various forms of epistemic superiority and privilege. So moving to the field of Latinx art history in the university, what is it? Is it art simply by people who identify as Latinx? Should Chicana, Chicanx, mainland island Puerto Ricans, Dominican, Dominican Americans, Cuban Americans, diasporic Central and South Americans, should, these, should this art and artist be considered Latinx? Well, that's up to the artists to decide. Um, is it art that renders visible political and community struggles, that seeks to render visible the after effects of empires? Well, yes and no, depending on how you answered the first question. So my aim is not, therefore, to offer an easy working definition, and I'm equivocating intentionally. I'm eager to hear from the artists today in regard to the use of the term and their vantage on the issues. However, I don't want to equivocate when I say that from the vantage of art history, the elision of Latinx and Latin American art poses real risks for the future of Latinx art. From my vantage in the classroom, this elision, while it might appear convenient, poses many problems. And of course, I'm not the first to say so. So in fact, it was over 20 years ago that Mary Carmen Ramirez raised the issue of the danger of homogenizing Latino and Latin American identities in the US. And similarly, Arlene Davila has written about the dangers of multicultural encompassment. In her 1993 essay, Brokering Identities, Art Curators, and the Politics of Cultural Representation, Dr. Ramirez observed, quote, curators, and I would add academics, who broker the exchange between transnational and multicultural interest groups will not only have to confront the reality of competing notions of identity, but will eventually be forced to choose between them. As evident in the case of Latin American versus Latino representation, what is gained by one group is lost by the other." Close quote. Twenty years hence, it's clear where the winds have been, particularly if one surveys the field in terms of the gross growth of Latin American art history versus Latinx. Of course, there are times when shared conceptual and thematic concerns among artists across the Americas need to be productively discussed. But from my vantage, it seems clear in 2016 that we need to keep the fields distinct. We need Latinx art, or we need Ch Chicano art, we need Puerto Rican art, mainland art. So in speaking with colleagues and reviewing syllabi and through experience, I've seen that the elision or melting, to borrow Dr. Ramirez's term, has not resulted in equal treatment. Set side by side, Latinx and Latin American art history are entangled, but distinct, particularly insofar as their relationships to moder the modernity so privileged by art history. 
So in what follows, I'll speak principally about what I see as a crisis in the field of Latinx art history. But I absolutely want to acknowledge that there have been many scholars in other fields whose research is absolutely foundational. And of course, we have three, if not more, among us today, Dr. Amalia Mesa Baines, Dr. Arlene Davila, and Dr. Chan Noriega. And of course, Judy Baca, Alicia Gaspar de Alba, um, Tomas Ibarra Frausto, um, Ralph Montañez Ortiz, and many others. In fact, the interest in other disciplines, Chicanx and Latinx studies, anthropology, American studies, film and media studies, literature, far outpaces the interest in art history. I embrace cross and interdisciplinarity in my work. I also think it's crucial that the art historical skills of critical visual skills are, are important. So what is the state of Latinx art history? And so I want to share with you some numbers. <clears throat> so since 2013, I've been tracking, gathering and tracking statistics on who and where Latinx art history is taught, also on the pipeline towards graduate studies and on the placement of newly minted PhDs into academia or into museums and cultural institutions. In fact, it seems very clear that in terms of Latinx art, museums and cultural institutions are more inclusive than the field of art history. And yet many of you read the article in the art newspaper from last month that presented findings on racial and ethnic diversity in museums and said that white Latinos only constitute 3% of curators, educators, conservators, and top administrators. So if 3% is more diverse than academia, we're in big trouble, and we are. Um, but there's, there's hope for the future. So in my research for an essay that I published in um, an issue of Aslan at the invitation of Chan Noriega and Dr. Charlene Villasenor Black, um, I presented the first round of statistics, and these were for a 10-year period from 2002 to 2012. I also circulated a survey, which I need to renew, and I'm happy to send it to all of you if you're interested, um, that asked university-based art historians about their training and teaching and research in the field. So I've now updated the figures to 2015. And so the first slide shows that in departments of art history that offer coursework at the undergraduate or graduate level inclusive of US Latinx art, there are 22. Um, faculty who offer courses closely focused on Latinx art, so a course, you know, history of Latinx art, there are only about 14. And these are um, slightly imprecise statistics because a lot of this is word of mouth. Um, so um, many of the faculty, many of these 14 faculty, myself included, are trained as Latin Americanists, but we've crossed over into the field, if not, at least in part, if not entirely. And of these 14 colleagues, I only know of one art historian whose appointment is specifically one in US Latinx and Chicanx art history, and this is Andine Chavoya at Williams, and they don't have a PhD program. So I'd like to read their names because presence and visibility is important. They're Ananda Corin Suarez at Cornell, Kenzie Cornejo at New Mexico, Connie Cortez at Texas Tech, George Flaherty and Cherie Smith at UT Austin, Tatiana Flores at, at Rutgers, Jennifer Gonzalez at UCSC, Judith Wakuha at University of Dayton, Andrea LePage at Washington and Lee, Abby McEwen at University of Maryland, um, George Vargas uh, at Texas A&M Kingsville, and of course Charlene Villasenor Black at UCLA. And if I'm missing someone, please forgive the omission and please tell me. Um, I do have a broader list, but these are people who specifically teach focused courses versus just including four lectures on it in their Latin American art history course. So if we add faculty and courses in other disciplines, we're in much better shape, 35 plus more colleagues teaching in other disciplines in anthropology and cultural studies and Chicano studies, et cetera. However, departments of art history that offer coursework at the undergraduate or graduate level focused, not just inclusive, but focused on Latin American art history is 99. That's extraordinary. There are over 400 colleges and universities with departments of art history, so 99 is fully a quarter. That's, that's extraordinary, and this is in comparison to when I applied to grad school, I won't tell you how long ago, there were only 10 schools that I could have gone to, and not all of those were PhD programs. So this has got to be, Latin American art history has got to be one of the fastest growing fields, um, subfields in art history. So then I un I'm undertaking a comparative analysis of the number of completed uh, PhD dissertations. So from 2002 to 2015, there have been 17 dissertations completed in art history focused on US Latinx topics. In, all, in other fields, you know, 34 plus. So that's a total of about 51 complete doctoral dissertations in 14 years. However, in Latin American art history in that same period, it's 131. So 17 
U.S. Latinx art history dissertations compared to 131, that's an extraordinary difference. Okay, where am I? So I've also been undertaking now a comparative analysis to dissertations in North American 20th and 21st century that are excluding Latinx art. Okay. So in 2015, there was one dissertation finished on U.S. Latinx art history. Um, in Latin American art history, just for that year, 20 were finished, and 111 in these other broader fields. It's sobering. Current PhD students in art history working on Latinx art at the dissertation stage, I'm sorry, there are nine. I need, meant to correct that. There are nine. And later this afternoon, Rose Salceda will read you their names. Current PhD students in art history working on Latin American art, 108. So I think you can see where the issues are. Um, <clears throat> so why such underrepresentation at the level of doctoral research on Latinx art history? Lack of representation of Latinx art in the art history curriculum, too few faculty to teach or mentor in the field, a time-worn canon and time-worn methodologies that remain resistant to effective engagement with histories of colonialism and imperialism and the legacies of global and local inequalities. Crucially, a sense of isolation among graduate students who do enter the field within their graduate programs. Underrepresentation of undergraduate students of color in art history and in the humanities in general. I think in 15 years at Tufts, I know of one Latina undergraduate major who graduated. And now she's gone on for a PhD, and her field is not Latinx art history. And I don't begrudge that. We, we're entitled to study whatever we want to study, just like everyone else, right? Um, so I want to mention this as well. So many of you are aware that a group of us have organized a forum called the US Latino Art Forum. And if you're not a member, please contact Josh Franco, who will be speaking this afternoon. And um, he'll be happy to tell you what to do to join. In a year, our membership has grown from basically 10 of us to 167. One of the things we've been doing is, and I'm sorry? Oh, it's higher. Rose tells me it's higher. So um, one of the things we've been doing is um, lobbying intensely the College Art Association, because that's our professional, fee our professional organization. And we applied for affiliated status last year, and we were denied. Um, fortunately, CAA has now had um, an influx of new blood. Suzanne Blier, the Africanist at Harvard, is now the president of CAA. Roberto Tejada is on the board. Um, we've been in intense conversation with both of them. I've reapplied for affiliated status. I still don't know the outcome. I'm encouraged. Um, but something that's happening that's very problematic is that in the spring, CAA reorganized uh, the way that you can search for dissertations in fields. And you'll notice, is there a pointer on here? That the, ca the, the categories are now Central American and Caribbean in all of the usual suspects, North America and South America. So these are principally sort of geographic, thematic, and temporal. Then you can use these subcategories over here, and I'll point out that there's African, Afri African American and African diaspora, and there's also Native American. Oh, thank you. There's also Native American art, but there's no category for Latinx art. I'm going to make that change. We're going to make that change. Because the problem is that how do you find out who the students are? How do you find their dissertations? I mean, we need to be cross-listed in several places. There's a category over here somewhere. Um, for race, ethnicity, and cultural studies. The only dissertation listed there is Josh Franco. I know there are people working on African American art that talk about race. So this is a work in progress, and I want to acknowledge, <laughs> I want to acknowledge that Suzanne Blier has been very attentive, um, but I think this is an important piece. We cannot allow ourselves to be rendered invisible because a category doesn't exist. Okay. Um, so in the university setting, we have to improve the structure of the pipeline and address entrenched, perpetually Eurocentric curricula. Many of you no doubt are aware that the College Board is revisiting the AP course in art history with attention to addressing racial and cultural bias. But I would go further to suggest that our courses need not, need not just to address bias through inclusion, but we just re need to rethink our methods. So it's not just about inclusion. And this is where this concept of Occidentalism, I think, is very useful. And it comes from Fernando Coronil, a cultural anthropologist. His formulation of, quote, the ethnocentric hierarchization of cultural difference that is ultimately connected to the deployment of global power, close quote, is provocative and useful for thinking about the problems of engendering, of racialization, of coloniality, or what we can think of as endemic white racial capital that continue to plague the field of art history. 
A critique of epistemic occidentalism directs us not merely to observe and denounce deficiencies in representation, but rather to consider the entire conceptions of the West that animate these representations. So there's also the leaky pipeline phenomena, and I'm heading towards my conclusion. There's the leaky pipeline, or the broken pipeline phenomena. Without more teachers, mentors, and crucially curriculum, students at the undergraduate and then the graduate level won't acquire knowledge or pursue research on Latinx art history, let alone replace us when we retire. Students focusing on Latino studies subjects who don't find mentors within the disciplines who at least know or are supportive of their interests will experience a sense of personal and intellectual isolation, and Rose Salcedo will discuss this among other issues shortly. There's abundant research on the issue on st of students of color, starting with under-resourced college prep education. Black and Latino students make up 37% of high school students, but only 27% of students taking AP classes, and only 18% of students who pass the AP exams. We must reduce bias in graduate admissions. And as a broad field of graduate study, the arts and humanities are seeing significant decreases. Of those who did enroll in 2014 in graduate degree programs in the arts and humanities, 70% were white, 9.7% Latino, 4.6% Asian, and 5.3% black. And there's no question that a lot of Latinx uh, students are going into the STEM fields. And of course, that's crucial too. But as a humanist, I'm worried about the humanities and, the per and how that's going to erode gains that we've made and create a field of humanities that is once again predominantly uh, mainstream and white. So um, we need to build a pipeline toward a more diverse university faculty. And of course, we need fellowships and support for scholars in the arts, for graduate students to write their dissertations, for undergraduates to have paid internships. And of course, I want to acknowledge that the Mellon Foundation Undergraduate Curatorial Fellowship is making inroads here. The Mellon is also partnering with the Inter-University Program on Latino Research. Um, <clears throat> the Ford Foundation, of course, has brought us here today. And its focus on inequality in all its forms is part of its mission statement. And it has a project called The Art of Change. So there is um, reason to be hopeful, if not fully optimistic. And of course, publications are the most important thing in our field. And we have this incredible series of books published by the Chicano Studies Research Center and the University of Minnesota Press, um, which um, has monographs on um, Latino artics, artists and is hopefully growing. But you know, I think uh, Chan Noriega has expressed concern about uh, the degree to which the series is being used. Um, I also want to acknowledge extraordinary books like the Resisting Categories, Latin American and or Latino of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, edited by Mary Carmen Ramirez, Hector Olea, and Tomasi Barafrausto. Wonderful monographs by Gisela Latour, Jennifer Gonzalez, Holly Barnett Sanchez, and Tim Drescher's forthcoming book on uh, murals in East LA. And then foundational catalog catalogs like Chicano Art Resistance and Affirmation, Phantom Sightings, Asco Elite of the Obscure. Max LA and Our America and many more. So in terms of publications, there is obviously wonderful scholarship. It's just perpetually invisible in the field of art history. So the last, the last two things I want to say is that part of what I've been doing is also surveying textbooks. And textbooks on American art history are absolutely abysmal in this sense. Uh, they include a very small smattering of artists, and they include pretty substantial errors. Um, so it might be commendable that authors of American art history textbooks are even talking about Latinos at all. It's usually Chicano muralism. Um, but in one example, a third edition, it confused the Guatemalan immigrant activist Luisa Moreno for Dolores Huerta. And from my perspective, this is because in the mainstream, there's no consequence to not knowing. So we have to make there be a consequence. We have to make there be a consequence. And textbooks on Latin American art history are just as bad as or worse, because on the one hand, I've talked about the problematic of melding. But Latinx art is absolutely not included in one of the foremost textbooks in the field of Latin American art history. It's just not there. Um, and never mind the global survey textbooks. They're terrible as well. Um, but there is reason to be hopeful. So the US Latinx Art Forum. Um, that a group of us created in October of 2015. I forgot to put our website on there, but it's uslaf.org. 
And again, please talk to Rose, myself, Josh, and please join the organization. And I think our ne next steps are going to be to continue to network, to begin to recognize the work of scholars. But in order to recognize, we've got the manpower to do it, but we need some funding because we want to give out some awards. So that's the next step. So thank you very much for your attention, and I very much look forward to learning from you. Thank you.